We continue now with book 24 of Iliad, and we will now take a look at what happens in the second movement. Well, right as we get to the second movement of this book, Priam has been told, go and see Achilles in his tent. There's obviously a question about whether he should do this or not, right? We've noticed, we've seen this throughout the entire Iliad. Do I trust what the gods are saying to me in the form of messages or whatever, right? And so uh, Priam will ask his wife at line 230. He called out to his wife, Hecuba, Dear woman, an Olympian messenger came to me from Zeus. I must go to Achaea's ships and ransom our dear son, bearing gifts to Achilles, gifts to melt his rage. Notice we're back to the opening line. We'll, we'll read the opening lines of the Iliad again when we get to the last to the last line of this book, but obviously the range is there. Tell me, what should I do? What do you think? This is fascinating that um, rarely in this poem have we had men asking women, what do you think? But notice here, Prime's going to ask, what do you think? He says, myself, a terrible longing drives me heart and soul down to the ships into the vast Achaean camp. But his wife cried out and answer, no, no, where have your senses gone? That made you famous once, both among outland men and those who live, who rule in Troy. How can you think of going down to the ships alone and face the glance of the man who killed your sons, so many brave boys? You have a heart of iron. Now, this is interesting because Achilles is going to say the same thing here in a little bit. And, of course, we're going to say, wow, what does it take to kneel in front of the man who killed so many of your sons and obviously your favorite, Hector, and beg that man for mercy? If he gets you in his clutches, sets his eyes on you, that savage, treacherous man. Notice how this echoes what Apollo said about Achilles, but it goes completely against what Zeus uh, right, uh, said about Achilles. He'll show no mercy, no respect for your rights. Come, all we can do is sit in the halls, far from my son, and wait for Hector. So this, this is the doom that strong fate sprung out I'm sorry, fate spun out. Notice this weaving metaphor is powerful, right? Because the first time we saw Helen, what was she doing? Weaving, of course, this weaving metaphor has come all the way through. I'm just trying to help you get a sense of how this book assumes all of the earlier motifs and messages, right? Uh, so this, this is our dude. That strong fate spun out. Our son's lifeline drawn with his first breath. The moment I gave him birth to glut the wild dogs, cut off from his parents, crushed by the stronger man, Oh, she says at line uh, 253, Oh, would to God that I could sink my teeth in his liver, eat him raw. Oh, which is exactly, of course, what you'll remember in book 22, right? Um, Achilles said about, about Hector, That would avenge what he has done to Hector. No coward the man Achilles killed. My son stood and fought for the men of Troy and their deep-breasted wives with never a thought of flight or run for cover. Well, Mama obviously is, is embellishing the story a bit. Obviously we know that Hector did in fact run. That's what makes him human, right? Um, and, and yet, she's right. He did fight. But the old man, right, Priam, but the old and noble Priam answered firmly, I will go. My mind's made up. Don't hold me back. We then will um, we'll get Priam getting ready to go on his trip, and he does a couple of very interesting things at, uh, starting at line 280 or so. Crowds of Trojans were mobbing his colonnades. He gave them a tongue lashing, sent them packing. Get out, you good for nothings. Public disgraces. Haven't you got enough to wail about at home without coming here to add to my griefs? You think it nothing, the pain that Zeus has sent me? He destroyed my best son. You'll learn too in tears, easier game. You'll be for our guy troops to slaughter. Now my Hector's dead. Uh, it's as if he's saying, uh, you know, Hector's dead and gone, and we're going to miss him because our city's going to fall, right? But before I have to see my city annihilated, laid waste before my eyes, oh, let me go down to the house of death. This won't happen. This is one more prayer that doesn't get answered. It's a fascinating study of the Iliad. If you want to go back and read it again sometime to just say, find every prayer and then ask whether they're answered or whether they're not answered. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Achilles made a prayer through his mother's Thetis to Zeus that the Greeks would all get jacked. Thetis asks, Achilles, or, uh, Zeus provides, and of course one of the Greeks that gets jacked is in fact Patroclus. Then we're told Priam herded them off with his staff. They fled outside before the old man's fury. Uh, this word fury is a fascinating study as well, right? So he lashed out at his sons 
cursing the sign of Hellenism, Paris, this will be our last, one of our last mentions, Noble Agathon, and, and then several of these, Polites, all, all, they're all listed, loud with a war cry, Diphibius, which of course theoretically was there at the death of Hector, but he wasn't, right? Even Lord Lydius, the old man shouted at all nine, he's got nine boys still remaining, rough commands, get to work, my vicious sons, my humiliations, whoa, if only you'd all been killed at the fast ships instead of my dear Hector, whoa, I wish you were all dead instead of Hector, but I, dear God, my life so cursed by fate, I fathered heroes' sons in the wide realm of Troy, now, now, not a single one is left, I tell you, whoa, so note the irony, I've got nine boys, but I don't have any sons. Right? This is again at lines uh, 300 and following, right? He even mentions the, the, his favorite three, and Mestre the Indestructible, Trollos the Passionate Horseman, and of course Hector a God among men, no son of a mortal man, which of course he was, right? He seemed a deathless gods, but Ares killed them all, and all he left me are these, these disgraces. And then look what he says about his boys. Liars, we think of Paris. Dancers. Heroes only at beating the dancing rings. You plunder your own people for lambs and kids. This plundering of the own people, of course, this will sound like something out of the, the biblical um, Jewish Old Testament from, you know, book, the, the book of Elijah or Hosea or something, right? Why don't you get your wagon, why don't you get uh, my wagon ready now at once? Pack all those things abroad aboard, we must be on our way. And then we're told, sounding very much like when Zeus screams at Hera, for example, terrified by their father's rough commands, the sons trundled a mule wagon out at once, a good smoothing one. And then we go into full detail about the cart. It's almost as if it's an Aristia of a different kind. Priam going on his Aristia, he's an old man, so he can't fight. So what does he do? Well, he gets ready to go on his, what might be his last journey. He, you know, Hecuba obviously thinks, right? We then will have the request of a sign, um, and, and you know, it's one of those kinds of things that, okay, hopefully it's going to be a good sign, Hecuba says. And at line 373, 4, 5 and following, Zeus in all his wisdom heard the prayer. Straight away the father launched an eagle, truest of Zeus's signs that fly the skies, the dark marauder that mankind calls the black wing. Broad as the door of a rich man's vaulted treasure chamber, well fitted with sturdy bars, so broad each wing of the bird spread out on either side as it swept it through the city. Flashing clear on the right before the king and queen, all looked up overjoyed, the people's spirits lifted. So in other words, yay, we got the we got it on the right. Of course, there's always this discussion about, okay, well, what do you mean right? Like the, the way you're standing will determine whether it's right or not to you. You know what I'm saying? The point being here, we interpret the signs from the gods in the Iliad, right? And sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. Here, the old man we're told is happy enough. And so he gets on the he gets on the um, in, in the wagon with uh, ideas and and off he goes, okay. And um, um, Zeus, we're told, will send down Hermes at line uh, three ninety five. Hermes, escorting many's your greatest joy, you above all the gods, and you listen to the wish of those you favor. So down you go, down and conduct King Priam there through Achaea's big ships, so none will see him, none of the Argive fighters recognize him now, not till he reaches Peleus's royal son. Um, and then um, we're going to have this interesting exchange between um, Hermes and, and old man Priam. Um, at line 440, Priam says, uh, uh, and the old and noble Priam said it once when asked by uh, Hermes. He doesn't know it's a god, right? He says, our strengths are hard, dear child, as you say, but a god still holds his hands over me, even me, sending such a traveler here to meet me. What a lucky omen. And, and, and then you get this sense that this is the character of Priam. He's always wanting to see the best, which is maybe why when his son Paris came home to Troy with the beautiful Helen, he decided, you know what, let it pass, right? Always looks for the best. Even though, in spite of the fact of what he just said about his boys, look at your build, he says about Hermes. Look at your build, your handsome face, a wonder in such a good sense. Your parents must be blissful as the gods. In other words, He's being reminded of his own son, right? The memories that Achilles has about Patroclus, Priam is obviously having about his boy Hector, right? Um, and then after an exchange or two where Hermes will lie to him and tell him that he's part of the Myrmidon clan and et cetera, et cetera, Priam will ask him at line 480 or so, the old man asks at once, 
If you really are the royal Achilles aid, please tell me the whole truth, point by point. My son, does he still lie by the beach ships? Or by now has the great Achilles hacked him limb from limb and served him to his dogs? What, what a question for a father to ever have to ask. The guided giant killer reassured him, So far, old man, no birds or dogs have eaten him. No, there he lies, still there at Achilles' ship, still intact in his shelters. This is the twelfth day he's lain there, too. But his body's not decayed, not in the least. By the way, the number 12 we pointed out in the last few books of the Iliad start to become really important, <clears throat> right? Um, and, and then some of you will ask, well, what's up with the 12 days of Christmas and all of that? What's up with the number 12 and the number of days? I'll let you Google it on your own. It's a fascinating study. But his body's not decayed, not in the least, nor have the worms begun to gnaw his corpse, the swarms that devour men who fall in battle. True, dawn on fiery dawn, he drags Achilles, drags round his beloved comrade's tomb, Hector drags him ruthlessly, but he cannot mutilate the body. It's marvelous to go see. It's marvelous, he says. Go see for yourself how he lies there, fresh as dew. The blood washed away. No sign of corruption. All his wounds sealed shut wherever they struck. And many drove their bronze blades through his body. We know this, of course, from Book 22, right? Such pains the blissful gods are lavishing on your son, dead though he is. The gods love him dearly. Well, this obviously is going to give Priam some sense of hope that okay, okay, we're all we're all going to be okay, right? They reach the ramparts. Um, we're immediately reminded of obviously Hector's boulder that jacked those ramparts. Hermes puts the soldiers to sleep, which makes us think, doesn't it, about the um, gospel accounts when the soldiers of their Roman soldiers uh, are are um, put to sleep in terms of outside of Christ's tomb and all of that, right? Then he will uh, disclose himself, Hermes will disclose himself at line 540. Oh man, look, he says, I'm a god, come down to you. I am a mortal, Hermes. My father sent me here to be your escort, but now I will hasten back. I will not venture into Achilles' presence. It would offend us all for a mortal man to host an immortal face to face. Which is interesting, because in the poem, if you think about it, most of the time, like Poseidon, he takes the form of Calchas, right? So in other words, we don't see gods face to face very often, although... We do have that with Thetis and Achilles. One more way that Achilles is special, right? But you, go in yourself, clasp Achilles' knees, implore him by his father, his mother, with lovely hair, by his own son, Neoptolemus or Pyrrhus, right? So you can stir his heart, okay? Of course, the ironies will abound because it will be Pyrrhus who ultimately in the mythology will kill Priam. It will be Pyrrhus or Eoptolemus in the mythology that will as well probably kill Hector's son, Isthanix. It's either him or Odysseus, depending on what you read, right? So Priam goes in, and we're ready now for the second movement of this symphony, and it is a beautiful movement, right, with Achilles himself, so powerful that I just want to read now this exchange. It's one of the most remarkable exchanges in poetry. We're told at line 555 uh, or so, Achilles had just finished dinner, eating, drinking. He's beginning to move now back towards the humane again, right, and being human. And the table stood near. The majestic king of Troy slipped past the rest and kneeling down beside Achilles, clasped his knees and kissed his hands, those terrible man-killing hands. It's always, the, uh, it's always the saying about Achilles. That had slaughtered Priam's many sons in them. Awesome. As when the grip of madness seizes one who murders a man in his own fatherland and flees abroad to foreign shores, an amazing simile here, to a wealthy noble host and a sense of marvel runs through all, he see, all, through all who see him. So Achilles marveled, beholding majestic pride. I mean, you're sitting there eating and all of a sudden there he is. Whoa, how did he get here? How did he get through my fortress guard? Uh, all of it, all, all the questions. His men marvel too trading startled glances, but Priam prayed his heart out to Achilles. All right, here we go. The supplication, right? He, look how he begins. Let's pay attention to the genius rhetoric that's goes, that goes on here. This will remind us, of course, of Book 9, when Achilles is met by a different embassy, and they will remind him of his dad then. Remember your own father, line 570. Great God like Achilles, as old as I am, past the threshold of deadly old age, no doubt, the countrymen round him, plague him now, with no one there to defend him, beat away disaster. Your dad's all alone, in other words. No one, but at least he hears you're still alive, and his old heart rejo rejoices, hopes rising day by day. 
to see his beloved son come sailing home from Troy. The ironies run deep here because Achilles himself knows, although Priam doesn't, that he's never going to Achilles never going to see his father Peleus, right? But I, dear God, my life so cursed by fate. I fathered heroes sons in the wide realm of Troy, and now not a single one is left, I tell you. Ironic, right? Because we know that nine, we just gave the number a few minutes ago, right, are there. Fifty sons I had when the sons of Achaia came. Nineteen born to me from a single woman's uh, mother's womb. A, a woman who produces a lot of sons. We're going to get to Niobe here in a little bit. And that mention, right? Nineteen born to me from a single woman's womb. And the rest by other women in the palace. Many, most of them, violinaries cut the knees out from under. But one... One was left me to guard my walls, my people, the one you killed the other day, defending his fatherland, my Hector. It's all for him I've come to the ships now to win him back from you. I bring a priceless ransom. Revere the gods, Achilles. So notice, he begins with his father, with Achilles, his father. Remember your father. He then goes to the sons, and then he goes to the gods. Revere the gods, Achilles. Pity me in my own right. And then he says it again. Remember your own father. I deserve more pity. Why does he deserve more pity than Achilles' father Peleus? I have endured line 590. I have endured what no other, no one on earth has ever done before. I put to my lips the hands of the man who killed my son. It's compelling. And we're told those words stirred within Achilles. This gradual evolution towards becoming human. Stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve for his own father. Taking the old man's hand, he gently moved him back, and overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam wept freely for man killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet, as Achilles wept himself, now for his father, now for Patroclus once again, and their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. Oh, I mean, let's just pause for a moment. The brilliant scene that's going on here. Old man Priam comes in, falls down in front of Achilles, begs for his son's body back, says, I am the, I'm the worst imaginable, most painful man because I, I'm begging the killer of my son, and by extension, all of his sons, right? And Achilles then is moved, and Achilles weeps, and he weeps for his father, and then he weeps for Patroclus, his best friend. They're crying together, sharing this moment. Then, when brilliant Achilles, line 600, had had his fill of tears, and the longing for it had left his body, his mind and body, he rose from his seat, raised the old man up by the hand, we're going we're gonna to have this, their hands touching again here in a bit, and filled with pity now for his gray hair and gray beard, he spoke out winging words flying straight to the heart. Now Achilles will speak. Poor man, how much you've borne. Pain to break the spirit. What daring brought you down to the ships all alone to face the glance of a man who killed your son? So many fine, brave boys. You have a heart of iron. Notice, before it was an insult, right, or a, or, or a, a criticism by Hecuba. Now here, it's obviously a compliment. Whoa, you really are brave. Come, he says. Please sit down on this chair here. Let us put our griefs to rest in our own hearts. Rake them up no more. Raw as we are with mourning. It's interesting you would use the word raw. We know, we know that word's been used. Raw as you are with mourning, as we are with mourning. What good's to be won from tears that chill the spirit? Exactly what that is, for example, said to her own boy. What good's to be won from tears that chill the spirit? So the immortals spun our lives that we, we wretched men, live on to bear such torments. The gods live free of sorrows. This spinning is, of course, this weaving metaphor is powerful. And then all of a sudden, it seems at, at first maybe out of place, but Achilles is himself, I think, trying to come to his resolution of his own crisis of faith. There are two jars, he says, line 615 or so. There are two jars that stand on the floor of Zeus's halls and hold his gifts. Our misery, one, the other blessings. Two jars, one holds bad stuff, the other holds good stuff. When Zeus, who loves the lightning, mixes gifts for a man, now 
He meets with, with misfortune, now good times in turn. When Zeus dispenses gifts from the jar of sorrows only, he makes a man an outcast, brutal, ravenous hunger, drives him down the face of the shining earth, stalking far and wide, cursed by gods and men. So with my father Peleus. What glittering gifts the gods rained down from the day that he was born. He excelled all men in wealth and pride of place. He lorded the Myrmidons, immortal that he was. They gave the man an immortal goddess for a wife. Yes, but even on him the father piled hardships. No powerful race of princes born in his royal halls. Only a single son he fathered, doomed at birth, cut off in the spring of life. And I, I give the man no care as he grows old, since here I sit in Troy, far from my fatherland, a grief to you, a grief to all your children. In other words, Achilles admits, sounding very much like, you know, the Confucian code of honor. I, I haven't, Chung Si, right, the great, the, the, the good man, the just man, I haven't taken care of my father. I haven't done the things that I should do as a son. And I've caused you a lot of grief in the process. And then he goes to, to Priam. And you, too, old man. We hear you prospered once as far as Lesbos, Marker's kingdom, bounds to seaward, by Thera East, and Upland, and Helm's Point, vast and north. That entire realm, they say, you loaded over once, once. You excelled all men, O king, and sons and wealth. But then the gods of heaven brought this agony on you. Ceaseless battles round your walls, your army slaughtered. And then he says, you must bear up now. Enough of endless tears, the pain that breaks the spirit. Grief for your son will do no good at all. This is exactly what Thetis, of course, said to, to, um, to Achilles. You will never bring him back to life. Sooner you must suffer something worse. Well, this is compelling because, of course, this is words that are spoken from Achilles to Priam, and they are obviously true, but they're also obviously words that Achilles is speaking to himself. Because soon Achilles will die at the walls of Troy.